Steve's got an unenviable task in trying to sketch the origins and the formation of the original Communist Party in this country, whilst at the same time giving you a flavour of how a revolutionary party used to behave and organise in Britain. Um, up and I think he's going to try and get up to around about 1943, before Hapal also has a tough session on uh, talking to you about revisionism and the anti-revisionist movement in this country which will set the scene for really how we came to the point at which in 2004, I better get that right because <laughs> I was here, uh, how we got to 2004 and how we came to be found in another party, yet another party in this country that calls itself communist. Um, but obviously, you know, we sat down, those of us who were here at the time when we sat down, looked at the movement and there really wasn't anywhere else we could go. There really wasn't anyone who behaved or organised like a communist party. Um, and actually we were very fortunate that we'd managed to arrive at a situation where we had the skeleton of a national organisation on which we could build. So, it is three busy sessions. We're going to have to be a bit strict with the timings um, because although it's important that you know, the speakers get everything than they can, at the same time we want to encourage as much debate and chance to talk and ask questions as we can. Uh, there are obviously a number of comrades in the room who are like old hands or whatever, but there's a significant number of you, you know, who haven't, either haven't been before or are new to the party, and you must feel like you've got the opportunity to ask whatever questions you want to ask, talk, talk freely amongst, amongst ourselves, you know, about um, the policies, direction of the old party, our party, how things operated, you know, there's no stupid questions because this is really the best opportunity you're going to get this year for these kind of conversations because the way it's going in society, the way things are going in this country at the minute, we're going to get wrapped up in all manner of political work this year and you're not really going to have much of a chance to stop and uh, reflect on um, these kind of questions. <laughs> well, comrades, I just want to echo what uh, the Chair has said in terms of welcoming comrades and friends of our party here today. Um, I think this could turn out to be a really exciting day of discussion after a very exciting day of, of practical activity yesterday, for which I thank you all. Um, I think the role that our party played yesterday at both the PSC and the National Shop Stewards Association, uh, or network I should say, proved yet again that although we're a small party and a growing party, we were punching, as we always do, much above our weight. So congratulations to everyone who was involved in that. Thank you. Um, today is going to be about learning and discussion. When I say learning, I don't mean that you lot out there are going to listen to what us lot up here have to say, write it down and memorize it. That's not learning. What I do mean is that because of the opportunity that you're going to have for discussion, in the course of this day of school, I think that we're going to all learn something from each other. In terms of the way we look at our Communist Party, where it came from, what it's up to now, and where it's going, most importantly. In our society, comrades, where the fields of information and education are as much dominated by the monopoly capitalist ruling class and its state as our culture and what passes for politics, parliamentarianism particularly, tackling questions of working class history and even more the history of our own British communist movement is not generally encouraged, to say the very least. Quite the contrary, in fact, as we know. What I and the other speakers who are going to follow during the course of today have to say will not be found on the BBC, on ITV, or on channels 4, 5, or 197. Nor will any light be shed on any of this in the glossy liberal Sunday supplements, and certainly not in the Sun or the Daily Mirror. Oh, and by the way, there's not a lot of genuinely factual information on the internet either, reports to the contrary notwithstanding. We're clearly, talk we're clearly taking a conscious step out of the bourgeois mainstream then, comrades when we meet here in South Hall in a hall named after a leading communist operating in the period we'll be dealing with in this session to discuss aspects of our own history. But stepping out of the mainstream is what communists are all about, it's what we do best. It's not mainstream to analyse our society from the class perspective of the exploited and the oppressed, nor is it mainstream to argue for and try to act towards the revolutionary overthrow of capitalism and the establishment of a socialist state run by the majority of our population, the working people, in our own interests, rather than those of a parasitic minority. That's not mainstream, neither are we. So here we are in West London on the 23rd of January 2011, gathered together to discuss British communist history. But I want you to close your eyes for a moment, 
literally rather than metaphorically. Close your eyes for a moment. Imagine that you don't have credit cards in your purse or wallet, that you don't have a mobile phone, and that when you get home, possibly by tram rather than bus, and write your next letter, it'll be on a manual typewriter rather than a computer. And there'll be no telly to greet you and attempt to lull you into apathetic indifference to the global exploitation of man by man. No Big Brother, no East Enders, not even the weakest link, which I would miss the most, I think. I want you to imagine, in fact, Gomery, that you're not in Southall at all, nor indeed in 2011. Instead, you're in a meeting room at the Cannon Street Hotel near St. Paul's Cathedral, and the date is the 31st of July, 1920. You're not studying Communist Party history, you're making it, and at its very beginning. Because that was the location, and that was the date, where Marxists of various shades and from various traditions came together after many months of difficult and complex negotiations in a unity convention to establish a genuine revolutionary party of the working class. But what was that unity to be around? It was unity around support for the new Soviet Republic, which had resulted from the seizure of state power by the workers and peasants of Russia less than three years before, and which, in the words of American communist John Reed, had shaken the world by ousting the capitalists and landowners, putting the working class in the driving seat, and pointing the way forward for the exploited and oppressed of the whole world. The great October Socialist Revolution, comrades, was and remains the most important single event in the entire history of humankind. Of that, there can be no doubt. And there's also the question of unity in seeking to establish a single British Communist Party, fully embracing Marxism-Leninism, and based on the political and organizational principle of democratic centralism. A party of a new type, which would be affiliated to the newly established Communist or Third International, set up just the previous year at what itself was an historic meeting in Moscow. Remember, comrades, it's still the last day of July 1920 in the city of London. So I want you to imagine that in this hotel meeting room where we're sitting, and I'll bet they don't have the room service we have in Southall in terms of curry and nice glasses of wine. Actually, that hotel was bombed during the war, but it was a bit of a dive when it did exist. Some of you are delegates from the British Socialist Party, perhaps you in this corner over here. Others of you, perhaps over here, come from the Socialist Labour Party, and I don't mean by that Arthur Scarville's shrinking coterie of fans, but we'll come to that later. Different Socialist Labour Party, to which famously was affiliated the great James Connolly, the Irish patriot and socialist. And perhaps the rest of you could imagine you're here to represent either Sylvia Pankhurst Workers' Socialist Federation, perhaps over there, the South Wales Socialist Society. Are there, are there any Welsh comrades in the room? Not today, I no, Pretend you're Welsh. Well. You're from the Socialist, uh, South Wales Socialist Society. And crucially, the Shop Stewards and Workers Committee. That can be Giles. Or maybe you're a left-winger within the Independent Labour Party or a member of the Guild Socialists, of whom I must admit I hadn't heard until I did the research for this presentation. You're all about to become foundation members of the brand new Communist Party of Great Britain. And in so doing, you're going to arm the working class of this country as never before in its historic battle for the end of wage slavery and the revolutionary transition from capitalism to socialism and then communism. Having established that, let's be more comfortable and return to Sackler Hall in 2011. Let's cast a retrospective eye, if we can, on where your organizations came from and what they represented at the time of the Unity Conference. And then to outline some of the key elements of the Communist Party's work in the first two and a half decades of its existence. As the Comrade Chair suggested, this is quite a, a, quite a daunting task, bringing us up to 1943, which of course is the date when the Communist International folded. I'm going to try and get there, but if I get cut off before, it's something we can, we can raise later in discussion. Sharpening and getting... Uh... Well, you, you did say you were going to be ruthless. <laughs> First, though, a word about the Labour Party, which we're always banging on about, aren't we, as the CPGB, and with very good reason. <coughs> but what now follows is going to be littered, probably, with slightly confusing abbreviations and acronyms. I don't want you to worry about this alphabet soup, though. It's, it's not a, a desperate situation. In politics, in left politics, we're always dealing with alphabet soup. We're dealing with the names of different organizations. I want to show you why you shouldn't be worried about this. In America, they actually have something called alphabet soup. I've got one of them here. It's a tin of pasta-shaped 
like letters of the alphabet in tomato sauce. Dead easy. You open it, nothing to be afraid of. You open it, and what comes out? <laughs> Dead easy. Are we afraid of letters like www.cpgbml.org? No. Far from it, we're very proud of it. Um, so don't worry about the alphabet soup which follows. I'll try where I remember to spell out the points of the organizations, but I think you'll get the truth. Um, yeah. So, let's talk a little bit about the Labour Party. We know that the Labour Party was established towards the end of the 19th century. From the very beginning, it was a revisionist, or, or rather a, a, a reformist party, which never had anything in common with Marxism. There were, however, members of the Labour Party, indeed organised sections of the Labour Party, which laid claim to Marxism. And we'll see who those were. We've mentioned some of them in passing, haven't we? In terms of those organisations represented at the Unity Convention. But I think in order to talk about Labour, rather than talking about 1920 and the Unity Convention, we need to go back a further six years to the beginning of the First World War in 1914. And the fact that, sadly, the vast majority of what was then the Second International rather than upholding the spirit and the politics of proletarian internationalism, caved in to the bourgeois governments of their own respective countries and supported an imperialist war. So in 1914, on the eve of that First World War, which was to sweep millions of British workers into the armed forces to kill or be killed by their fellow workers of other lands, there was a profound contradiction, one which remains, in my opinion, within the British labour movement. On the one hand, there were great mass organizations, the trade unions, the TUC, the cooperative movement with all of its manifold societies, the Labour Party, the Independent Labour Party, which, uh, for those of you who don't know about it, was the left social democratic wing of the, socialist, uh, of the Labour Party, and it maintained a, an autonomous existence within the Labour Party. Together, these organizations embraced millions of working people but without a socialist outlook. That's the key thing. They were led by men, and it was, for the most part, men, who preached and practiced reformism and class collaboration, mass organizations without socialism. On the other hand, and this is the contradiction, there were a number of socialist organizations accepting scientific socialism, the ideas and approaches of Marxism. These were courageous but small, isolated, and often sectarian. So here we have socialism without the masses. Mass organizations without socialism on one hand, Socialism without the masses, on the other. With the war, all the oft-voted and oft-applauded resolutions against war of the Second International, which I just referred to, were very quickly forgotten. The official trade union movement, as uh, Beatrice and Sidney Webb put it, became part of the social machinery of state. Trade union and Labour Party leaders, to their internal discredit, recruited workers for the trenches to fight against workers recruited by German trade union and social democratic leaders, who had also tried to transform their organizations into part of the social machinery of state. Incidentally, most of us learned at school that the first uh, Labour government was elected in 1924. That's technically true, but in doing a bit of research to, to organize this presentation for you today, I discovered something I didn't know. There actually were about seven, I think it was, uh, junior ministers in the Lloyd George Tory Le uh, Liberal Coalition of 1916 who were from the Labour Party. So even at that early stage we can see the role of the Labour Party in terms of its class collaboration, its support for imperialist war. Nothing changes, comrades, in that sense. Quelle surprise, as they say in French. Um, there were many workers in Britain, of course, who resisted participation in the war, we know that. Many in the ILP, for instance, there's the first of your alphabet soup citations, lacking revolutionary clarity and finding no organizational leadership to guide them in the struggle. They expressed their opposition in individual resistance, pacifism, conscientious objection, quite a courageous thing to do, but very ineffective in class terms. The British Socialist Party, the BSP, and the Socialist Labour Party, SLP, that's again um, not the SLP of which we're so fond in the 21st century. That's the SLP of James Connolly and Arthur McManus. The SLP and the, B and the BSP were both divided at the beginning of the war. And it was not until the 1916 conference 
that the anti-war and international section of the BSP defeated the pro-war leadership. John McLean on the Clyde side, our Scottish comrades will know about him yeah. and the history, the role in history that he played, a very honourable one, gave a stirring example of how to lead masses of workers into political resistance against imperialist war. And as the war continued, and with all the suffering that war entails, new organisations arose from the militant rank and file, mainly led by Marxists and revolutionaries, organisations in the factories, shipyards and pits, like the Shop Stewards Committee, that's uh, who Giles represented today, <laughs> as we know. And above all, the Clyde Workers' Committee that fought first against the effects of the war, which meant sackings and redundancies on the one hand, but industrial conscription on the other, contradictorily. Rising prices and rents, and then step by step, these people began to direct their fire against the war itself. In other words, not pacifism, but revolutionary defeatism, more and more. But with all these examples of individual and collective opposition and action, something was still lacking, comrades. Lacking was a political party of the working class, a Marxist party, a new type of party, capable at one and the same time of explaining to the workers and the people the reactionary, unjust nature of the imperialist war and of leading them in the struggle against it as an organized, disciplined and effective force. As the war inexorably moved on, from month to month drawing its toll, many militant workers in the BSP, alphabet soup, SLP, in shop stewards and workers' committees, in ILP or trade union branches, they came, not yet clearly necessarily, often only half consciously, to feel the urgent need for some new type of organisation, for some new type of party that would meet this crying need that the British working class had at the time. In Tsarist Russia, such a party already existed. And that party, the party of the Bolsheviks, that was to become the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the great Soviet Union, of which we're so proud, had not only organized a mass political struggle against imperialist war, but had led the workers and their allies onwards to the triumph of the October Revolution. And the October Revolution aroused in Britain not only a deep enthusiasm among the mass of workers, reflected later in a widespread and effective fight against British intervention in Russia, and we'll talk about that. But it led the more advanced socialist workers, especially in the BSP, SLP, and in the Workers' Socialist Federation, about which we'll talk again, in the Socialist Society in Wales, in the Shop Stewards Movement, and in the left wing of the ILP. It led all of these comrades to pose the key question, what is it that with all the long British traditions of working class organisation, the long experience of struggle, with all the British Marxist groups and societies, what is it that they in Russia had that we didn't? And to reflect on the need in Britain for a new type of political Marxist revolutionary party capable of leading the working class to win political power. That was the key question, now as it was then. The war ended, of course, wars do. The brief post-war boom swiftly turned into the deep post-war depression. The promised land fit for heroes to live in, that's a quote from the then Prime Minister Lloyd George, became the land of dole and desolation. Unemployment figures topped first a million and then the two million mark. Miners, engineers, railwaymen, cotton textile workers moved into struggle. Even the soldiers and the police force, briefly it must be said, showed militant signs of rebellion against the old order. There was a national police strike in 1919 where you actually had um, coppers, both in uniform, on both sides of the picket lines. One group saying that the others were, were scabs, the other one saying that they were troublemakers. Um, as a result of that, striking in the police has been banned ever since, but you, know, you never know what's going to happen. From all over Europe came reports of revolutionary struggle. In the whole colonial world, and this is crucial, comrades, because we're an anti-imperialist party, if we're nothing, all over the world, great national liberation movements arose under the inspiration of what had been achieved by the workers and peasants and their allies in what became the Soviet Union. Communist parties began to be formed all over the world. And then in 1919, historically, the Communist International. The struggles and opportunities of the stormy post-war years heavily underlined the need for a new revolutionary party at this stage. And here I wanted to break away a little bit and talk about the hands-off Russia campaign in this country because it was significant. We've been talking a lot in terms of our practical political activity as a party in the last months and years about the need 
to draw the trade union movement away from complicity and collaboration with war crimes. That's precisely what the Hands Off Russia campaign was about. This was where communists, people who were to become communists in the months and years that followed, led the struggle, a united struggle by working class people to prevent other workers from assisting in the intervention by 14 imperialist powers against the young Soviet Republic. That came to a head, as I think many of us remember historically, although not personally. I don't think any of us in the room is old enough to remember it. The struggle around the Jolly George, a ship which was being used to ship arms to the interventionist imperialist forces operating in the north of the Soviet Republic. That was a successful campaign, and it helped galvanize a united opposition and a united sense that we can move forward in defense of the Soviet Union, in defense of our own class interests, and that a new party is indeed necessary. It, became, it began to be clear then that the old Marxist groups, through their role, or sorry, though their role had been very courageous, true enough, very honorable, and at times highly important, were no longer sufficient. That's the crucial bit. No longer sufficient. They weren't enough. They weren't up to the task confronting the advanced workers of the era. They weren't up to the task of meeting the needs of the British working class as they then stood. Something more was needed, comrades, than loosely organized federations of socialist propaganda groups. A party was required that would at one and the same time fulfill three main tasks. And if you're going to take any notes at all during this presentation, here's the time to do it. Here are the three main tasks that I think we need to identify at that period. One, give the working class a scientific socialist theory a socialist perspective, a socialist consciousness based on Marxism. Help the working class and its allies to understand the capitalist system under which they live. How to end it by winning political power and how to replace it by a system of socialism. Secondly, give leadership to the struggles of the working class and working people on all the issues which confronted them from day to day. Wages, prices, social services. And I'm reminded here that we're in a period of uh, a growing anti-cuts movement which our party needs to insert itself into and exercise an increasingly leading role over, in my view. Rents, issues of peace and democracy, issues that would lead, guide and coordinate such struggles, from the most simple right up to the struggle for political power, the seizure of state power by the working class. And thirdly, comrades, to provide the vanguard, the most conscious section of the British working class, with a new sort of organisation, a revolutionary organization capable of leading the struggles of the working people. Now it's true that this need was not yet seen with full clarity by all of the forces involved. And there was much confusion and controversy amongst those militant revolutionary workers who strongly felt the need for this new party. But that a new party was needed was generally appreciated. The situation demanded it. Experience had proved it. The struggles of the international working class movement, and particularly in the new Soviet Republic, confirmed it. History, as it were, was shouting aloud for the formation of a communist party, as indeed it was in 2004, but that's for a separate session. A new type of party was then needed. History puts tasks before the working class, but the forces to fulfill those tasks come from living individuals, real people, and existing organizations with all their experiences, their conceptions, all their strengths, all their weaknesses. What and here we get back to alphabet soup, I'm afraid. What were the socialist and revolutionary organizations and groups in Britain from which the Communist Party emerged? Um, how am I doing for time? Uh, you've, you've got uh, 35 minutes. Right, okay. That being the case, I'll go through this in full because I think it is worth it. Um, first, the oldest, largest, and most important was the British Socialist Party, the BSP, was a direct descendant of the Social Democratic Foundation founded in 1883. The BSP had been a constituent member of the Labour Representation Committee in 1900, which of course founded the Labour Party, had quickly quitted it, becoming really reaffiliated to the Labour Party only in 1916, at a time when that Labour Party, as we've seen already, was part of the Lloyd George coalition supporting and indeed conducting the imperialist war on behalf, behalf of the British, working, uh, British ruling class. It was also a constituent member of the Second International, or what was left of it. It was divided in its attitude at the beginning of the war. The internationalist anti-war section had defeated the old pro-war executive, led by a bloke called Hindman, with whom we're probably familiar, at that 1916 conference, 
and henceforth with its organ, the core, it carried out a consistent and courageous struggle against the war and against the British intervention in Soviet Russia. For 40 years, it had educated, with its predecessor, the SDF, it had educated and developed a succession of outstanding revolutionary leaders, keeping alive and spreading, though with some weaknesses, the understanding of Marxism. Organizationally, it wasn't strong. It was a loose federation of clubs and branches, mainly propagandists and very isolated from the main mass of the working class. But amongst its leaders in 1918 to 1920 were people like Albert Inkpin, who went on to become the secretary of the new Communist Party when it was established. J.F. Hodgson. These two comrades together played a leading part in the negotiations to merge the Marxist groups and form a real Communist Party. John McLean. Again, our Scottish comrades will know him well. John McLean of great Clyde battles had by 1919 broken his associations with the BSP. William Gallagher, another courageous and very famous Scottish comrade, was a member. But at this time, he was more involved in and identified with the shop stewards movement on the Clyde. Harry Pollitt, a man who was to go on to become general secretary of the party for many, many years, <coughs> gained a growing reputation as a courageous fighter and a militant speaker for socialism. Theodore Rothstein, who had spent years in Britain as a refugee from Tsarism, but an active theoretical leader in the SDF and the BSP, returned soon after the war to his Soviet homeland. His son, Andrew Rothstein, was unfortunately a foundation member of the Communist Party of Britain. Largely, I think, because he didn't see anywhere alternative to go. He died not that long ago. Uh, he was a man of incredible courage, amazing commitment, and a fantastic memory. I learned a great deal about the history of the British and international working class movement from him um, during my time in the CPB, God help me. So here it was, it was this BSP, the British Socialist Party, that was the main initiator, the most consistent negotiator for the formation of the United Communist Party, and whose members formed the majority in the Communist Party once it was actually established. Then we come to the Socialist Labour Party, as I say, not the one of uh, Arthur Scargill and his ilk. This one had begun as a left split from the Socialist Democratic Federation early in the century, and its strength was overwhelming in Scotland. God, you Scots have got a lot to answer for. <laughs> Disgraceful behaviour. <coughs> it had a good record of militant struggle against the war and against the intervention in Russia. Its small membership, in the main, in the shipyards and machine shops around the Clyde, was deeply entrenched in the shop stewards movement and provided many of the best leaders of the great shop steward struggles during and immediately following the war. Among its leaders were men of outstanding mass experience and also some of outstanding narrow dogmatism. Again, nothing new there. The SLP, like the BSP, accepted Marxism, at least in principle. Though much of its Marxism was abstract, general, doctrinaire, it played an outstanding role in spreading socialist education among the Scottish workers. And its press and publication section had an influence completely out of proportion to its membership. Above all, its hatred of the corruption of the right-wing Labour leaders led it to draw the conclusion it should stand against contact with and affiliation to the Labour Party. And we're going to see in the course of this presentation, I hope, if I get it done in time, that the question of the Labour Party affiliation thereto and relations with the Labour Party were a crucial uh, point of division, a crucial controversy, if you will, at the Unity Convention, which was shortly to come. So, we can see that the SLP was a combination of positive, militant, and on the other hand, negative doctrinaire aspects. Some of the leaders who we haven't mentioned yet included uh, Tom Bell, again, uh, somebody that many comrades will know. But there were also people of a very narrow outlook, like uh, Mitchell and Clooney, neither of whom I know anything about, actually. But along with the BSP, the SLP then did play the main secondary part in founding the Communist Party of Britain. Thirdly, and I think very interesting, we come to the Workers' Socialist Federation. Um, hadn't always been called that. It actually grew out of the suffragette movement as applied to working women in the East End of London under the leadership of anyone can, can anyone guess? Sylvia Plankton. Yeah, which one? Sylvia. Yeah, the only decent one of the whole lot. That's right. So the Workers' Socialist Federation participated throughout the negotiation for a communist party. It was very small initially and based almost exclusively in the East End of London, led by Sylvia Pankhurst, as we've just established, 
who is described as a, an active and extremely personally courageous leader of the left wing of the pre-war women's suffrage movement. The WSF, again, alphabet soup, with its paper, The Workers' Dreadnought, opposed the war and was extremely active in making known and rallying support for the October Revolution and the Young Soviet Republic. But the WSF, and above all Sylvia Pankhurst herself, brought to the movement an extremist, super-revolutionary sectarianism. And we'll see this in terms of their initial refusal to join the United Communist Party. In fact, Sylvia Pankhurst declared her organization unilaterally to be, before having had any discussion with either Comrade Lenin, who of course was still alive, or indeed the Third International generally, declared herself and her group to be the Communist Party, in, in brackets, British section of the Third International. Uh, neither of which designations were correct at that point. But she did play a positive role, as we'll see. The WSF preached anti-parliamentarianism, and we'll actually see, um, as we continue with this, Lenin's attitude to that, which is expressed in Left-Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder. There's a whole chapter, in fact, dedicated to Sylvia Pankhurst and her left errors. It was categorically opposed to any form of contact with the Labour Party. Can't say I blame it subjectively. It belittled immediate action on partial economic issues and participation in the struggles of the trade unions. It stood for pure revolution, that's in its own words, for a straight, undefiled, uncompromising revolutionary advance without stages, halts, or alliances. It brought an atmosphere of intrigue and personality into the unity negotiations. And by personality, we mean here Sylvia's role herself. She was a larger than life character. She tended to dominate any unity negotiations that she took part in. Then we move on to the South Wales Socialist Society. The nearest we've got to a Welshman here, I think, is Giles. That's good enough. Okay. It, uh, uh, when, you, when you take part in the discussion subsequent to this presentation, try and put on a Welsh accent, it'll be good. <laughs> the South Wales Socialist Society was the fourth main and consistent participant in these unity negotiations. And these are people based in the mining valleys of South Wales who had long traditions of extremely, extremely militant struggle. I'm going to skip through this bit to an extent. Organisationally, the SWSS, South Wales Socialist Society, was extremely weak, as were many of these organisations. In fact, it was a loose federation of local socialist clubs. But behind it stood the deep class consciousness, the deep revolutionary feelings of the Welsh miners, especially in the Rhondda. In fact, it ceased to exist as an organisation before the negotiations were completed and was replaced by the South Wales Communist Council. Sounds like a step in the right direction. And finally, comrades, there's a question of the shop stewards. The other crucial link in this chain of the development of our party in its early stages. And I say our party deliberately and uh, thinking back to the fact that while we're not organically, organizationally part of the chain of the CPB, our traditions, our goals as seeking to become a vanguard party organising the working class for revolutionary struggle, for the seizure of state power, for the development of socialism, for the dictatorship of the proletariat, all of those are what the CPGB was initially all about. We trace our roots, if not organically, certainly ideologically and spiritually, back to the period we're now talking about. We're talking about our own comrades here. Crucial. Shop stewards. There are a number of other working class and socialist organisations directly or indirectly involved in the formation of the CPGB. The National Shop Stewards and Workers' Committee movements arose as a coordinating committee of the militant shop stewards organisations that emerged in the First World War. Shop stewards had existed before, particularly in the engineering industry and as part of the normal trade union machinery. But the great area of militant shop steward struggle was bloody Scots again, in the Clyde side. <laughs> But the movement did spread to Northern England and indeed to London. The shop stewards and workers' committees began their struggle against the economic attacks of capitalism resulting from the war, but inevitably, in the fight against direction of labour, uh, that was the government <coughs> organising workers into certain sectors of the economy as part of a wartime planning session. The Clyde Workers' Committee, founded in 1915 under the leadership of William Gallagher, about whom we'll hear a great deal more later, hopefully, became later the Scottish Workers' Committee, and it had its own newspaper, The Worker, which was in due course taken over by the Central Committee of the New Party. So you can see how all these threads are starting to come together. Among the people involved in the shop stewards movement, particularly on the Clyde, was, as we've seen, William Gallagher, but also J.R. Campbell, 
uh, Johnny Campbell, who later went on to become the editor of the Daily Worker. I'm going to give you, a, I'm probably running out of time, I'm going to give you a very brief aside on this. It's, it's anecdotal and probably apocryphal. But when Johnny Campbell was the editor of the Daily Worker in the days when you could still send telegrams domestically, he apparently, aside from having a bottle of whiskey in his editorial drawer, unlike many of his Scottish comrades who were very abstemious, he also had a stack of blank telegrams. Um, and any time an editorial, a letter to the editor appeared in, uh, at the Daily Worker desk, he had a stack of these, um, these telegrams, stamped as follows, bollocks, abusive letter follows. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's true, but it's, it's done the round in the Morning Star for many, many years. So, there are a number of smaller groups, uh, the Herald Leagues, the Guild Communists, who we, we've talked about. Now, the Guild Communists are an interesting group. These were people who were largely small business people, artisans, as the, the name Guild would imply. But actually, one of the people involved in the Guild Communists at this point was a certain R. Palm Dutt of our general acquaintance. Robin Page Arno, also of our acquaintance. I think he went on to become a communist MP, in fact. That I'm not sure about. No. Was he not one? Okay. And the Socialist Prohibition Fellowship, who in my opinion should be prohibited. <laughs> <laughs> Their whole idea, remember, at this, at this time, of course, there was prohibition from drinking or manufacturing alcohol anywhere in, in the U.S. And there were a group of socialists who followed that view, probably on the basis that alcohol had proved, in some cases, to be the curse of the working class. You know, it was destroying families, destroying lives. Anyway, that was their view, not necessarily mine. Okay, let me move on, comrades, because I haven't got a lot of time left. Um, We've now established the party as a result of this unity conference. But we're, we're in a position where the party has been founded, but there are still problems of sectarianism, there are still problems of people thinking in a small, um, sectional way, for example. Revolutionary British workers who come by their own experience to hate and reject the corruption, the opportunism, the policies of the reformist leaders could very easily tear themselves out by the roots from the labour movement and in their sincere revolutionary disgust with right-wing betrayal, isolate themselves from the mass workers still under opportunist influence. And there was this aspect to the new party. It quite correctly identified the role that the Labour Party was playing, while the discussion about Labour Party affiliation was, was still continuing. It's not to say that advanced workers were wrong, in other words, to oppose Labour Party social democracy where and when they did. Um, the question of parliamentarianism, um, whether the new party was going to engage in parliamentary politics was solved fairly easily. The question of affiliation of the Labour Party was a much more difficult question. Um, the instinct of many of the forces involved in forming the new party was not to do so. Lenin advised tactically, and I stress tactically, that the Labour Party be supported, but only, and I quote, as a noose supports a hanged man. Um, that's not something I'm going to go into in any detail. What I would do is refer you to the excellent analysis, uh, and I think very timely analysis, that Comrade Hapal has done on this question. It's to be found in his book on social democracy, which I commend to you all. Definite must. Must be read. Copies at the back. Ah, excellent. Even better. Right, okay. Let's talk about the Communist International, which, as we know, has been established <laughs> the previous year to the unity negotiations in, in Britain. While the delegates to the Unity Convention were fighting out the tactical line of, of our new party, a similar debate on a larger international scale was taking place at the sessions of the Second Congress of the Communist International. Similar differences of approach and tactics existed in varying degrees throughout the world revolutionary movement at this time. There were ten British delegates at that Congress, officially and or unofficially. Some or all of the Congress sessions between July 19th to August 7th, 1920. Six were officially registered as delegates, and these included uh, Jack Tanner from the Shop Stewards Movement, which some of you may have heard of. Tom Quelch, who was part of the family that uh, knew, uh, knew Lenin, in fact. I think Quelch, Harry Quelch, I think it was, was his dad, um, operated a revolutionary or certainly left-wing printing press out of what's now Mark's house, Mark's Memorial Library in Clerkenwell Green. William Gallagher attended as the leader of the Scottish Shop Stewards, and Sylvia Pankhurst arrived late and attended later sessions, which is actually where she was uh, not chastised so much as criticised in a comradely way by Lenin over her ultra-left position on 
parliamentarianism in particular. Here again, the great debate was repeated on parliamentary activity and relations with the Labour Party. But it did get itself sorted. Okay. I do want to briefly talk about Lenin's uh, comments on this. Because he said that the formation of the British Party, he's writing this in a letter to Sylvia Pankhurst in, in August 19th. August 1919, I'm sorry. He was in favour of its formation without delay, he said. Even if the disagreement on tactical questions meant that at first two parties would be formed working side by side. And that was briefly the case. We had the Communist Party of Great Britain, we also had the Communist Party, British section of the Third International under Sylvia. The crucial thing here was the need, said Lenin, for the Communist Party to immediately begin to cultivate intimate organic links with the mass of the workers. Here we have our Communist Party established. Despite the support of notable figures in the Labour Party, uh, we're talking about the Labour Party now, despite the support of notable figures such as the Independent Labour Party, James Maxton. Do people remember James Maxton? No, Glaswegian, was it? Yeah, I think he was. As I say, the Scots have a lot to answer for, in this case, genuinely have a lot to answer for. <laughs> this guy represented the left wing of social democracy within the Labour Party, but actually was uh, to be found later on speaking on the same platform as a certain Oswald Mosley while maintaining his credentials as a alleged socialist. The Labour Party itself actually decided against the affiliation of the Communist Party, which settled the question, um, rather. Even while pursuing an affiliation and seeking to influence Labour Party members, however, the CPGB promoted candidates of its own at parliamentary elections, running as Labour members. Following the refusal of the affiliation of our party, the CPGB encouraged its members to join the Labour Party individually and to seek Labour Party endorsement or help for any candidatures. Several communists then became Labour Party candidates, and in 1922, we're only two years on now from the foundation of the party, Shabruti Satrapala, after whom this hall was named, and Walter Newbold were both elected as communist MPs, although they actually ran and won as members of the Labour Party. Throughout the remainder of the first part of the 1920s, um, the party continued to fight internally over its approach to Parliament, over its approach to the Labour Party. It was never, it was never formally resolved in terms of um, attitudes at branch level. A lot of disagreement. And then, of course, 1924, with the onset of the first Labour government, we had the Zenobia letter. The Zenobia letter intended to discredit not just the Labour Party, which is what we learned in school, but actually the Communist Party. It was trying to prove that the Communist Party was engaged in subversive activities, would that we were involved in more, <laughs> among the armed forces and elsewhere. It was forgery, clearly, and it was aimed at promoting the electoral chances of the Conservative Party. And we know now, of course, it was actually the work of both MI6 and white Russian counter-revolutionaries. It has no credibility. But throughout the 20s and most of the 1930s, the party maintained the Leninist view that the Communist Party should consist of revolutionary cadres and not be open necessarily to all applicants. We have a similar policy ourselves in terms of candidate membership, in terms of interviews of potential members. The CPTB as the British section of the Communist International was committed, of course, to implementing the decisions of that higher body to which it was affiliated. In the general strike of 1926, it played a very major role, a very honourable role. It called, I think, perhaps naively on the leadership of the TUC to take a revolutionary position. That failed to happen. But even in the wake of the betrayal of that general strike by the Labour Party and the TUC, the miners' strike, which then ensued, drew the support of the party very actively. This whole period, then, shifts into one of the third period, as it was called in, in communist international terms. We might also refer to it as, as class against class, where the party was at the same time as... Um, organizing or trying to organize separate left unions within the trade union movement under the auspices of the Red International of Trade Unions. It was also denouncing the Labour Party as social fascist. Socialist in name, fascist in deed. This was the policy of the Communist International. It was the policy that was pursued in this country as well as a result of being affiliated to the Communist International. 
What was the result of class against class policy? Well, it means that social democratic and laborist parties were seen as equally as much a threat as openly fascist parties, and therefore described as being social fascists, as we've said. It also meant, as we've said, that the CPGB sought to develop revolutionary trade unions and rivalries to the established TUC bodies. Um, there were some examples of success on this front, actually, and I think quite surprisingly. When I came across this in the course of researching my presentation, I was quite surprised. There was a miners' union, a separate miners' union, set up again in Scotland. God, you get everywhere. <laughs> separate miners' union set up in Scotland. And Arthur Horner, who was the communist leader of the Welsh miners, um, briefly had a separate uh, miners' union, even in an area where the existing miners' union had such support. The other thing that was going on at this stage, we're now moving into the late 20s and the, the early 30s, was work among the unemployed. And the Communist Party played the leading role, not just a leading role, but the leading role in the National Union of uh, the National Unemployed Workers Movement, so, led by Wal Hannington. Comrades probably remember him. He's also famous for having uh, written a book on parliamentary procedure, how to chair a meeting which I think is one of his more minor contributions to the movement. Wasn't it Walter Citrin who wrote that? No, I think Walter Wal Hannington certainly wrote one of them. Yeah, there's two. Yeah. Mr. Chairman is Walter Hannington. Yeah. No, I think Comrade Paul was right, but some might. Um, <laughs> policy changed at, at both international and national level with the Seventh World Congress of 1935. Seventh World Congress of the Common Term, where with the rise of fascism in Germany, the policy of the United Front against fascism was put forward by the great uh, Georgi Dimitrov, who himself, of course, was um, put on trial by the Nazis and turned the tables on the Nazis. Um, later went on to become the first Prime Minister of Socialist Bulgaria in the wake of the Second World War. Here at home, in the 1935 general election, Willie Gallagher was elected as the Communist Party's first MP in six years. And actually, our first MP elected as a communist and with Labour opposition. He beat the Labour Party, in other words. He sat for West Fife in Scotland, a coal mining region in which it had considerable support. During the 1930s, again, the CPGB opposed the Conservative government's policy of appeasement towards Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. On the streets, party members played a leading role in the struggle against the British Union of Fascists, led by Oswald Mosley whose black shirts had tried to emulate the Nazis and anti-Semitic actions in London, particularly in London, but also in other major British cities. And comrades, particularly comrades based in London, will remember historically the, the great uh, battles of Cable Street, where the Communist Party was the main force in organising physical attacks on the Nazis to prevent them marching in uh, a provocative way in an overwhelmingly Jewish working class area. It's to our party's great credit that we were able to do that. Okay, we're nearly there, comrades. Um, 1939, a great controversy, but I don't think it should be controversial for us now. Initially, when the Second World War erupted from the British point of view in September 1939, the party took what I consider to be a knee-jerk reaction. It sided um, with those who were opposing the Nazis and said, right, we must support the war effort at all costs. A matter of mere weeks later, the Comintern met on the question, and that party policy had to be reversed under direction from the Comintern. It meant that the existing leadership under Harry Pollock were forced to resign and were not actually reinstated until the nature of the war changed. In other words, rather than being a war against fascism, this was an imperialist war on both sides. That was common term policy, and in my view, that was a correct policy. Harry Pollock was forced to resign. He wasn't reinstated until 1941, when, of course, the entire class nature, the entire international nature of the war changed with the fascist attack on the Soviet Union. Um, in fact, uh, I think Palm Dutt at this stage stepped onto the main stage and became the General Secretary of the Party. At the same time, because of its stance um, against the war, because of its stance claiming this was a war of imperialist aggression on both sides, the Daily Worker, which since 1930 had been a publication which had never missed a day of publication, was banned by Herbert Morrison, the then Labour, I might say, Home Secretary. Any guesses to who he might be related to, by the way? Mandelson. Yes, he's Mandelson's granddad. We love them both. We love them both. Um, in 1942, after the party policy changed with the attack on the Soviet Union, 
the paper was reinstated. And the only other thing I wanted to mention prior to the dissolution of the Comintern in 1943, which seems to me as a convenient place to stop this particular presentation, is the role that the Communist Party played, particularly in London, but also um, elsewhere in big cities, in organizing working class people to shelter against the bombing, against the blitz. It's particularly true in London, where middle class people in the suburbs of London, people with gardens, even within London, had Anderson shelters. You could dig a hole in your garden and stick up a semi-bomb-proof piece of, con a piece of uh, corrugated metal that would probably protect you against everything but a direct hit. But if you lived in the slums of East London, there was no... A, you had no garden, and B, there were no provisions made for you at all. And it was the Communist Party, something we don't actually often hear about. It was the Communist Party that led the struggle of ordinary East End working-class people in London to occupy the tubes and turn them into shelters against the bombing. That had been specifically banned by the government. The Communist Party organized East End workers simply to occupy the tubes. And it became such a mass movement um, that the government simply backed down. They had no choice. But the Communist Party is remembered in East London, particularly for that as well, among a certain generation of, of East London. So finally, comrades, and again, I, I apologize for having to do this so briefly, as, as the chair suggested. This topic itself could have been a whole day school in, in its own right. Um, 1943, the common turn is wound up. Now, the official reason given for this, of course, was that the communist parties in the various countries had reached a stage of political maturity where it was no longer necessary to have direct international guidance. Certain comrades sitting in this room, looking, looking at me uh, straight across the table, suggested otherwise in writing. Um, namely, that this was... Um, a concession made to the Allies in the anti-Hitler struggle. We're not going to pose a threat to you anymore. Whatever the reasons, um, in 1943 the common turn was wound up, as I say, and it ended one particular era in the early history of our movement. Now, I know in our next session we're going to hear about the sinking of the Communist Party into the morass of Christian white revisionism. But now seems like a, a good time to end that. I'm not going to take us up to the British Road to Socialism, but I suspect Comrade uh, Papal will mention that. I'll leave it there, Comrades, and open the floor up to discussion via the chair. Thank you very much.